Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. As the nation confronts the newest wave of Islamic extremism, the barbaric violence that has emerged in Iraq, Syria, and beyond, the threat of terrorism against the American people is again foremost on their minds. And if the horrifying beheadings of Western journalists continue, the pressure for full-scale American military action will intensify. So U.S. diplomats, in an effort to quell the violence, are being challenged anew to find allies. As unlikely as it may seem, Iran could be the prime target for collaboration. For the next half hour, we're very fortunate to turn to a guest with extraordinary insight into contemporary Iranian culture. Ramita Navai, an Emmy-winning journalist, former Tehran correspondent for the Times of London, who went undercover in Syria for Frontline. Now this fearless British Iranian journalist is out with her first book, City of Lies, Love, Sex, and Death, and the Search for Truth in Tehran. In a beautiful collage of stories, Navai untangles the double lives of Iranians whose survival is conditioned on lies in an underworld of illicit love, pornography, drug use, and rampant political corruption. In her fascinating exchange with Jon Stewart on The Daily Show, the comic news host invited the possibility that modern Iran could actually identify with America as Tehran's culture grapples with new social problems. Aren't all cities of lies, Stewart inquired? So I want to begin by asking our guests, under what circumstances Iran and America can find truth together as partners, or if that's wishful thinking? Ramita Navai, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me. So, what do you think about that opening question? I think it's a really interesting question, and I think that Iran and America have worked together, collaborated before. So in 2001, they shared intelligence over the Taliban. Um, so they, they, they share intelligence over, over common enemies. Uh, in 2001, it was the Taliban, um, and now it is the Islamic State. Uh, did anything come of that in 2001? No. Did it help the relationship? No. But they did come together to fight a, a greater enemy, as they are doing now. Culturally, you're right. We have more in common with America than we like to think. And that's exactly the same from the American side. You know, Iranians are very open to American culture. Uh, Iranians are very welcoming of uh, American tourists in Iran. You always get a lot of attention as an outsider, and especially an American tourist in Iran. That truth is beginning to seep through, that truth about the commonalities of these experiences. So your book, in, in part in exposing some of these secretive realities in the Iranian experience, will uh, enable Americans to relate. Why don't you expand on that? Well, what I didn't want to do with the book was kind of a big show of, look how Iranians are normal, they're, they're just like you and me, and wow, Iranians don't have tails. So I didn't want to do that, because of course, you know, youth are youth everywhere in the world, and youth struggle with, you know, ident sexual identity and with pushing boundaries, and of course it's the same in, in Iran, in, in Tehran. I wanted to show kind of the, the, the nuances of Iranian society and the complexities of Iranian society. And in a way, as you say, you're making this comparison with America. Yes, that there are similarities. So, you know, there are parts of society that are quite polarized, as politically there are here. You know, you have two different, two very different sides. I also wanted to show the gray area in between, all the layers that make up Iranian society. Well, one of those layers is gender, sex, pornography. Um, there is an underbelly or undercurrent where there is a very prolific, prevalent culture mm -hmm. encompassing those aspects of Iranian life. And, and I wonder, uh, to what extent will they ever be public? I'm not sure if this is a cultural thing, but yeah, it definitely has seeped in. So I would say that what is happening in Iran is partly a result of 30 years of an Islamic regime and is a reaction to an oppressive environment and a re reaction to oppressive laws. Uh, and a reaction to being judged by society, so societal, you know, societal constraints. And what I see in Tehran, which I think is really interesting now, is this kind of sexual awakening that's bubbling up among the youth. 
and it transcends class and it transcends kind of levels of religiosity and it is changing society slowly. I think partly as well this is generational, so a big percentage of the Iranian population are young, they're under the age of, of 35, which means that change somehow, cultural and societal change, is inevitable. It, it will happen, but how fast or slow, who knows. I mean, I, I kind of liken what's happening in a, in a way to um, what happened in Spain after the fall of Franco, this kind of backlash against uh, against this oppression and against censorship. It's not on the same scale, but there is something bubbling away, there is something happening. Is this going to be an effort that is undertaken by Iranians or by the wider community of Iranian Americans and you know, the, the larger expanse here in terms of opening up the culture? Well, I mean, I think Iranians are very united in feeling that whatever change happens, they should be in control of it. They've seen what's happened with the Arab Spring. They've seen what's happened in the countries around them, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and Syria. And they definitely do not want Western intervention. They definitely want... But I, I'm not necessarily a cultural intervention in the sense of an exchange, as opposed to... The, I, I, the feeling I get from being in Iran is they're not interested in that either. Mm. Um, they're very happy with... The, the path that they are on. They Part are, of that path has been absorbing some of the contemporary American life. Well, in a more, global more way, so, right. in, a, in a global way, mm -hmm. in a way that every single country in the world, you know, is, it absorbs right. uh, Western culture. But I wouldn't say Iran absorbs it any more than any other country. I think that's a... Um, that's uh, globalization, really, is kind of what's happening. So the internet has opened Iran up to the, to the, to the world, as has happened in lots of closed regimes. Mm -hmm. However, in Iran, you know, there, there are also, we mustn't forget, a big group of society, a big, big uh, chunk of society in Iran that is very happy with the regime, that doesn't want kind of Western-influenced culture, that doesn't want change. So there is this clash between those who do and those who, those who don't. But I th it's important to understand, first of all, why the revolution happened, and that also the revolution has been good for a big part of society, serves a big part of society well, who felt completely disenfranchised pre-revolution, and are very happy with the status quo. And because of this push and pull, because of these two opposing groups, it means that Iranians aren't necessarily united in their vision for cultural change in Iran. There are many Iranians who do not want cultural change. And in fact, you see this battle played out right at this very moment with President Rouhani, who is pushing for cultural change, and hardliners who absolutely don't want it. And this has been going on for years. Hmm. These stories, which are based on your sourcing over many years in Iran, mm -hmm. um, reflect the incapacity or inability of young people from this generation mm -hmm. to live in the way that they want to. I mean, that's a, a, a theme here, that there are elements that, of, of a Western society that uh, can be realized to an extent here uh, without pushback, and that's not happening yet in Iran. So the title, City of Lies, you know, for me can be viewed really positively the fact that you have to lie in order to survive in Tehran, in Iran. Because what it shows is Iranian resilience, the Iranian need to really want to live a life that they want to live, that they really need to feel that they're being true to themselves. So they're extremely adaptable people and they have, they, they lie in order to live the lives that they want to lead. So they adapt kind of society's rules to, to fit themselves. And those lies include homosexuality, um, prostitution. Well, any, in any, any sphere where there are serious repercussions, either because you'll be judged by your peers, by society, uh, or that you'll be trouble, in trouble with the law. That's generally where, where people lie. And also, Iranians, to an extent, lead double lives without sounding over dramatic. You know, you, there are two, two selves, really, uh, if you live in Iran. You have two selves. You have you that's in, behind four walls, that's inside. It's a private you. And usually that's 
very different to the public you, the public face you put on for everybody around you. Uh, what I think John Stewart was trying to get at in his interview with you was the fact that status will determine, just as it does in America, whether or not you can really live the life you want to. I mean, is that something that resonated with you? Yes. So, as with so many countries in the world, it helps if you have money. Mm -hmm. You know, so you do see different justice system for those with money and those without money. That's definitely, that's definitely true of Iran. And, I mean, one of the more pernicious things here is the way that the police interact with women, and especially women who, who want to have some autonomy in relationships that may be deprived of real love or the kind of um, romance that, you know, one aspires to in a relationship. Yeah, I, I wasn't trying to make any political statements um, about the police, or I wasn't trying to make statements about corruption uh, within government. And I, this was interesting. I liked what John Stewart picked up on in that, well, actually, the same happens here. Um, regarding police, well, yeah, you get corrupt police everywhere and you get corrupt police in Iran. I, that, that is not what I wanted to pick up on. But I think you've definitely hit on something which is really interesting, is the role of women in society in Iran. And that's, you know, it's, what is it? it's confusing and it's contradictory. So on one hand, there are more women in higher education in, in uh, university than there are men. So women are highly educated. Mm -hmm. You know, in many homes in Iran, I think uh, it, it would be surprising for a Westerner to know that women rule the roost. On the other, how does this translate in the workplace, for example? How does this translate uh, in, in society? Well, women are often not CEOs, I, I guess the same as this country. You know, so it doesn't translate into important positions, important jobs. And just because you have a university education, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a great career in front of you. I think the hope from some Americans' perspectives is that the seeds of egalitarianism are planted in Iran, if, if there is one regime or one country in which there is that hope for what could be translated into a democratic or pseudo-democratic state. Is that viable? Well, what does democracy and do Iranians want Western uh, democracy? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's part of the problem with Iran that, you know, that people... And we should weed out democracy. I mean, let's take the Constitution. Let's take the Bill of Rights. I mean, let's really go into the, into the depths here of what they may want. And it doesn't have to be necessarily derived from the American Constitution could be derived from the South African Constitution or any, any state, but I'm, I'm wondering if the seeds are there to, to develop that. Well, I know what Iranians definitely don't want from my experience, and of course this is anecdotal, so this mm -hmm. is you know, me spending time there talking to people over the last 10 years. What they don't want, as far as I understand it, is Western intervention, is any kind of big change, is revolution, uh, is mass protests on the street because they've done that before and it didn't work. Several the last years ago. time they protested, yeah, was in 2009 and it didn't turn out the way they wanted it to turn out and the protesters were, were crushed. So Iranians really are quite resigned to the fact that change will probably happen very slowly but what's uniting them is that they really accept that change has to happen from within. They're looking at Rouhani at the moment and, you know, they hope that Rouhani will be able to change things in a way that the reformist President Khatami couldn't change things, even though he promised so much change. Culturally, he did make headway. Culturally, Rouhani is making some headway at the moment. It's interesting in what spheres he is and he isn't making headway. Uh, well, expand on that. Well, civil society hasn't changed much. Rouhani said, uh, you know, made all the right noises about what was going to change, but civil society hasn't changed. There have been, you know, uh, a staggering number of executions since the beginning of this year. I think for over 400 people have been killed so far. There are over 30 people, uh, 30 journalists in prisons across the country. Uh, culturally, things are opening up. So he's kind of winning that battle because there is a battle going on between the hardliners and between Rouhani, and the hardliners mm -hmm. would, would rather not the country opened up. And of course, he's, he is concentrating on the nuclear issue. I think he wants that to be his ne legacy, and that's an important 
uh, problem to be solved. And if he does solve that, it will definitely open Iran up economically. It will open Iran up to the world. Let me just ask you quickly, would Rouhani, a, a presidential administration of Rouhani, be possible without the Green Revolution, the earlier protests? I mean, do you think that that became more viable as a result of this insurgence? And, and, and it was, there was a clampdown, but ultimately that pervaded the air. Well, Rouhani isn't part of the reformist movement. Right. He's not, he wasn't part of the, the Green Movement at but all. He, but he's not Ahmadinejad. I mean, you know, there's a difference, right? Well, uh, yes in, in and no. In terms of reform-oriented versus... Y yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, many people voted for Ahmadinejad because, simply because he wasn't a cleric. Mm -hmm. They saw him as a kind of populist technocrat. Uh, Rouhani is definitely part of the system. He's definitely, you know, he, he's in a perfect position, actually, because he is close to the hardliners and he's not hated by the reformists. Uh, or by the, the younger generation coming of age. I mean, he's no, I mean, I mean in, you know, in, in certain parts of town, people really look to him and love him, and mm -hmm. he's a hero, but he's certainly no reformist. You know, but he's, he's, he, th this is part of the reason, I think, that people are hopeful that he can change things around for them, is because he straddles this precarious position between hardliners and the reformists. I think if he was a reformist, people would have less hope because they've seen how the reformists have been clamped down on. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's really extraordinary. We were talking about this off camera before how uh, years ago, not so long ago, uh, Iran was part of an axis of evil. I mean, the tide is turning, possibly? What, what? Possibly, possibly not. So uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the interview, you know, in 2001, Iran and America did collaborate, did share intelligence. Nothing happened. I think Iran is one of those, you know, exciting countries. It's impossible to predict what will happen in Iran. You know, th some of the best uh, Iranian analysts I've spoken to always get it wrong. I, 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 I've never spoken to anyone that's accurately pr predicted what will happen in the country. Mm -hmm. Hearing you, it, it seems to me that the more important question might be, well, what can Iran's neighbors learn from it in terms of, I mean, it, it, the city of lies is a beginning um, versus city of death. You know, you'd rather have a city of lies that emerge into sort of a realistic um, uh, space for humanity. But, but city of death is, is Syria. I mean, quite literally, it's a city of death. I mean, a country of death. But what I'm, what I'm wondering is, given the tension between Sunni and Shia in this region, um, is that a division that can be overcome by learning just that, that life goes on in Iran? I mean, there's corruption, there's, there's obviously an um, elite class that benefits, but, um, but people are not dying in the way they are in other countries, and you don't see the insurgency of extremism. So what can Iran's neighbors perhaps learn from city of lies. I, Iran you know feels like a very stable mm -hmm. peaceful country. Right, exactly. It's uh, you know it's a f it's a functioning country. It's a very sophisticated country. Um, it uh, has a very sophisticated society and you certainly can live a, a great life in Iran. You know it, it it is a fully functioning comfortable country to live in. It's it's not some crazy Middle Eastern horror story full of crazy fundamentalists. Yes, it's divided. Yes, it has its problems. But certainly, as you say now, Iran is looking more and more like the healthy country in the Middle East. And, and I think Iranians really appreciate that. And that's partly why Iranians, uh, certainly the Iranians I've spoken to uh, from all walks of life, feel very strongly that they are happy to close ranks because of what's happening around them. They don't want a bloodbath. Mm -hmm. You know, they look at their country now and it's stable. You know, it has a government that's functioning. It, you know, everything works, everything operates. Do educated Muslims around the world appreciate that? I can't speak for educated. I mean, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, is your sense from your reporting and the reaction to the book, and I know it's, it's recently released, but is your sense that there is an appreciation of the uniqueness of Iranian culture mm -hmm. um, something that we can take with us and, and that 
uh, can be embraced in parts of the Muslim world where there's not um, even the opportunity for freedom of expression. Obviously, sometimes it's behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, for me, it's definitely not uh, a religious thing. Um, and it, the, the book was not, uh, was not in any way religiously minded or, or bent for me. Kind of Islam happens to be the religion of the country. Sure. And of course, it, it's much more important than that. And everything is politicized and religion has been politicized there. But as, this is as far as uh, I'm concerned in the message that I was trying to convey. So I, I don't think it is about uh, religion and something that Muslim countries should look to Iran to. Because of course, you know, it's like saying Christian countries. Christian countries are so varied. You know, which Christian countries? Latin America is completely different from, you know, but, Great Britain is completely different from France and Italy. So it's the same in, right. in the Muslim world. You know, you've got very different peoples that aren't necessarily united by just a religion, as you'll find in the Christian and Catholic worlds. Well, I appreciate that this is an, in a critical attempt to, to look at um, the darker side of Iran. I just see, uh, as much as it's a city of lies, a city of opportunity, too. I mean, that, that to me, rang true uh, just as much as um, looking at how, and, and maybe we can talk about this, Iranians, um, if not as a mass movement, because we just described how that was clamped down on, but how individual Iranians are fighting back against some of the obstruction um, that they face when they're attempting to realize their freedom. So I'm wondering, you know, as this was going to press, if you, if you found yourself more or less hopeful than when you were collecting these perspectives, and again, this was over a decade probably, of sourcing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do believe that Iranians should themselves be in charge of their destinies and their futures. And for me, it was more kind of, I wanted, a, I wanted Iranian voices to be heard. And I think Iranian voices have been eclipsed by the nuclear crisis, by Iran's uh, position in, you know, geopolitically in the world and its relationship with, with other, you know, with its superpowers and other countries. Um, but also, you were talking that, you know, it's a country of opportunity. I would say what I really feel in Iran, that especially in, in my, my birth city, Tehran, is that it's a very kind city. You know, this is the, 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 the real thing that I felt when I've been in Iran, and I felt it from kind of diehard regime supporters, people who view, view themselves as kind of fundamentally Islamic, to secular, uh, westernized Iranians, that Iranians share real warmth, share real kindness from right across the spectrum. And this is really what I wanted to show. And where is the truth heading? Who knows with Iran? Who knows? It's impossible Because to it's tell. been tumultuous, hasn't it, over the last decades? I mean... Yeah, uh, Iran has had a tumultuous history over, over, over the last you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Right, right. But you're, you're, yeah, you're right. It's, it's, been a, it's been a tricky kind of 30 odd years for Iran. And who, where will it go? Who knows? But it's, that's what makes it such an exciting city, uh, such an exciting country to live in and such an exciting country to watch. You just don't know. <laughs> Ramita Navai, thank you so much for joining us today on The Open Mind. Thank you for having me. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other Open Mind interviews. And check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming.